Hello everyone and welcome again to Tell Me Over Coffee. Today we have a very interesting guest who will be putting a bit of light in many questions that I have for her. Hello Sebastiano. And um, that many people will be delighted to hear the answers. So we will be waiting for our guest to get online so I can invite her to uh, join me. I hope you all had a great weekend and have started a great week. And as I say, I hope everyone is being very, very responsible with this COVID and everyone is wearing their masks and following all the um, security instructions. Um, well, what else can I say that I have not said now? Um, as I said, our guest of today um, is right here and we are going to invite now we are waiting for her to connect so i'm not going to say hello hey good afternoon good afternoon how are you i'm good thank you okay so let's say hello to everyone hello paul hello sebastiano hello everyone that's going to be joining us this afternoon as I said, um, when I just got live, this afternoon is going to be very, very interesting and very exciting because there are so many questions that um, I think many people have maybe not asked before, but we are going to ask you, I am going to ask you, and they are very, very interesting <laughs> questions. And I am very sure that everyone is going to be very happy with the answers. So <laughs> let's hope so. <laughs> yes. So let's start. Good afternoon to all and welcome again to Tell Me Over Coffee. Our guest of today is a Danish born, multilingual Danish, English, Spanish, Barcelona based writer and director. She started her film studies at the European Film, film College in Denmark, where she received a scholarship from Nordisk Film for being most promising student. She worked as an assistant editor in post-production company, but then moved to Barcelona in 2005 and took a detour to New York as well to complement her studies as a film director at the NYU School of Professional Studies. There she directed and worked on several short films. Back in Barcelona, she made a post degree in film directing at the Fundación CPA Salduin. Since then, she has written and directed several short films and documentaries while working freelance as a director, videographer, and editor. Her latest short film, Born This Way, is currently, do currently doing the festival circuit. And her next short film, Women Fart 2, was recently selected by the, excuse me, <coughs> Donna's Visual Visuals Pitching Program at the La Alternativa Film Festival in Barcelona, but has now been picked up by Danish producer Meta Louise Foldeke, who with whom she is working to trans transform it into a Netflix series. I can't wait to see that. <laughs> she is currently in pre-production for her next short film, The Pill, which is being produced by an international Facebook group. Furthermore, she is in early development of series about, of, excuse me, of, a series about sex education. She is a member of Donas Visuals and EWA and is actively involved on equality and creating more opportunities for women and people with diverse backgrounds in Denmark, Spain, and the United States. Before I introduce her to you, I would like to read two quotes dedicated to her persona. Eric O cinematographer that helped her with one of the films said I first met Louise working on a short film and she was the first AD on it she showed herself to be a passionate and thoughtful filmmaker all the while managing to communicate to a multinational cast and crew in three languages we subsequently then collaborated on more projects where Louise was the director Again, her passion was palpable and her commitment to the craft is very apparent. She worked well with her actors 
and was fantastic at communicating her ideas while being open to new viewpoints. I would not hesitate to work with Louise again. Carlos Martino, an actor, says, Louise is a brave and talented writer-director with a strong voice who loves to dive into complex matters. She gifted me with Christian, a character who made me grow as a person, a character with a thousand shades and full of depth and life. Louise is kind-hearted and shows both leadership and sensibility. Louise Briggs Anderson, welcome. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. So, how did it all start? Anyone in your family part of this industry? No, actually not. Um, this is something I can't even remember when it started because I guess I was just so young. I've always loved films. I always loved storytelling. I know I was a child. I'm a lonely child, so I don't have any sisters, any brothers. Um, so I was always very creative and, you know, coming up with stories and ways to kind of just play with myself in my room alone. <laughs> um, and, and I just always loved films. And I just remember from an early age, like trying to figure out uh, what does the producer do and what does the director do? Because I wasn't sure, you know, what they were, the responsibility of, of each of those um, positions. And when I found out, I said, okay, so I want to be a director. That's what I want to do. <laughs> so no, no, no one in my family. Okay. The, 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 the fact that you're choosing to be a director, you find it, it's because there's more creativity than a yes. producer? Okay. Yes, definitely. That's what definitely. I thought. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> you left home quite young uh, and to live quite far from home. I mean, you just didn't go to the, you know, so the next city. You just left the country. Yeah. How did your parents take all this, you being an only child? And did you always have full support from them? Yes, I've always had full support from my parents um, in my career, in my career choices. Um, they always encouraged me to go for what I believe in. And, you know, um, my parents are divorced. They, they got divorced when I was very young, when I was two. So I grew up with my mother. Um, but I have relationship to my dad as well. And really both of them have been supportive. Um, mm -hmm. Maybe not so much in <laughs> leaving the country <laughs> mm -hmm. because obviously that's hard for any parent. Um, but with time, especially I know my mom, because, you know, as I grew up with her, um, she has learned that it is better to have a happy child, even though that child is far away from her than having her close and then not be happy. So this is what she has come to accept. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, it's, it's, it's really hard. You, you do understand it when you're a mom. So you'll understand it when you're a mom. <laughs> yeah, but I don't plan to become a mom. So I, I might not ever understand it fully. But obviously, I can, I can understand how hard it is to let go of your child, especially so young. I was in my early 20s. Mm -hmm. um, and I just came to Spain and I didn't really know anyone. I hardly knew the language. It was just very adventurous, but it was basically what I needed in my life. Um, so yeah, I can understand it from, from a, an adult and a parent's point of view. <laughs> That's good. Is this your J job? No, it is not. This is my, probably the biggest goal of my life <laughs> to turn it into a day job. Um, I think perhaps I didn't choose the right country. I think a lot of people who live in Spain or Barcelona will understand the struggle it is to actually find job as, or live off being a, a director mm -hmm. or a writer even, or really any creative uh, position within the film industry. Um, can be very very hard and um, I think for me now I have found a way to manage this so I have a part-time job um, in the mornings and in the afternoon I dedicate all my time to my to my projects and some of them make money and some of them don't <laughs> well we, we all I think we all live that situation yeah you're, you're not alone you're not alone <laughs> and we are many 
I think that that that's actually a thing that um, I think is something that people should maybe be more open about and talking more about. Um, also, the whole theme of failure, which I think is a big taboo for many of us. Um, you know, through social media and all this, we want to look as good as possible. We want you know everyone to think that we have success and that we are successful, while basically all of us are struggling and we all face uh, failure and struggle and hard times. Um, and it's all something that is going to push us forward. And each time we learn something about it. So it's really not that dangerous. Uh, the good thing would just be if people could be more open about it and, and talk about their failures and talk about their struggles. So so that I think I realized in a very late age that, um, you know, like you said, I'm not the only one. We all struggle. So. Yeah, but what you just said, it is true that because um, I have encountered this and, and sometimes it's, it's not that I don't want to ask it. It's just that um, I, I don't want I don't want my guests to feel uncomfortable about the mm -hmm. question. When I ask, is this your day job? Yeah. Um, sometimes it is true that um, we can think that if we say this is not our day job, I have a part time job and um, that allows me to eat, to live, mm -hmm. to survive. And then I do this on, on the side um, that maybe no one's going to be um, looking for you or booking you for jobs because you have another part time job. Exactly. But, but that's because of the mentality we have in Spain. It's completely yeah. different. Um, in the northern part of Europe or even in, in, in the, the United States or Canada. It's completely different. It's normal that you have a, a part-time job until, yeah. you, until you hit it. It's normal. Here, it's, 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 it's a bit different. So I just think it's a matter of um, in this industry, not, I'm not saying that the whole country has to change mentality, but yes, the industry must change, must chart, start changing mentality in Spain. Yeah. In order to, to give everyone opportunities, yeah. this is one of this is one of the, the changes that we need. Um, I agree. In which language do you consider that your creations work best? Uh, I think I prefer to to write in English actually. So usually when I start, like when I have an idea, when I start a script, I almost always start out in English, mm -hmm. and then kind of depending on the project and if I. You know, if I realize that, no, this is probably something I would want to do in Spain or this is something I want to try and maybe take to Denmark, then I will change the language accordingly. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, my Danish will be most correctly <laughs> because that's my my native language. Uh -huh. um, and and then right after will come English and then in the end will come Spanish. Um, although I have in the past you know, lately in the past few years, I've started to write more things in Spanish and feeling much more comfortable with that. But knowing that grammatically and, you know, the language and the dialogue is not going to be perfect uh, yeah. in that language. But yeah, I would definitely see creatively. I often think in English and, and have ideas in English and dialogue in English. Mm hmm. Okay, tell us a little bit about the Muse process because I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's going to be a new thing. And I assume that um, for many people uh, who are watching this um, interview do not know what the Muse process is. Yeah, so I found this some years ago um, because a, an American production company called The Still Motion Mm -hmm. um, it's an Emmy awarded company. They've done loads of films and videos. Um, and they're all about kind of giving back to the community. Mm -hmm. So they started out by doing loads of tutorials. Um, they even did an app at some point, um, also with tutorials and, and different tools for filmmakers. Um, so I kind of just started following them and watching what they were doing. Um, and then they launched this website with the, the Muse storytelling process, which is kind of just a, a process that they have developed. I can tell you that it's very, very inspired by the hero's journey. Mm -hmm. And for anyone who, who doesn't know the hero journey, um, it is Joseph Campbell, who was um, uh, a writer that really studied mythology and stories. Um, and he wrote a book, well, he wrote several books about it. And then Christopher Vogler, which is another writer uh, from Hollywood, 
came in, took that book, and basically wrote another book that's called The Writer's Journey, and he put it in, in more simple words. And I can't recommend that book enough for people. It's, it's a very interesting book, and you'll see that pretty much all Hollywood productions will, you know, they have it as a template. Um, so it's very, it's very good for, for screenwriting. Um, and this, so this Muse uh, storytelling process is a little bit, well, quite inspired in the whole hero journey. Mm -hmm. So it is a course that you do basically um you you can go i'm not sure actually because i haven't visited the, the the website in in some time so i'm not sure if they're still there and doing it uh, but you can definitely google either the production company still motion or uh muse storytelling process and probably something will come up so um you would have you know you would do a, a profile with them you can log in then you have the course there they also have courses on how to do interviews um and this is very uh focused on documentary as mm -hmm. well um so i used it for for one of the short documentary films that i made so it's kind of about like how you structure your story how you you know get mm -hmm. started and how you structure it <coughs> Sorry. Um, how did Muse process help you with your documentary Musa and the education of boxing? Yeah, so I actually I um I was researching for um a documentary that I wanted to do about uh, boxing classes in prison. Um and I met this young boxer called Musa. And uh, just did a small interview with him. And I realized that he was really like powerful on screen and very interesting young guy to listen to with lots of passion. And, and so I thought, hey, why not do a little piece on him? And I thought, okay, so I'll do the, the Muse uh, storytelling process and kind of use it as a, um, you know, to try it out. Um, so... I, yeah, so I, so, so I use that process and when you log into the website and you have your profile there and you go through the different um, modules of the course, they will also let you download different um, templates and things that you can then use for your, you know, for your own films later on. So I would just kind of stick to that process throughout the story. And this was very helpful for me because uh, I haven't done that much documentary, at least not at the time. Um, so it was a good way for me to kind of know how should I address this? Where should I start? What should I be looking for? And just kind of, you know, make sure that I have a nice little story with a beginning, middle and end and, you know, everything that you must have to kind of engage the, the audience. Mm -hmm. um, okay. Uh, now we're going to go to, uh, to, uh, no, before I go to statistics, correct me if I'm wrong. I know you are very passionate about fiction, but you have done more documentaries than fiction. Um, I think perhaps that's because you're looking at my website. So um, in recent years, I probably have done a little bit more of documentary and uh, commercial work because I was at some point kind of trying out to uh, see if I could do some freelance work as a director and, and editor. So I would do my own projects. Um, well, I would do my own projects and I, and I would do projects with my own clients is what I meant. Um, so I would do like little spots or documentaries, things like corporate things. Um, and I quickly realized that uh, it didn't give me that much money. And it also didn't give me that much pleasure because what I really want is actually to to be in the fiction world and to work with actors and the whole preparation of the shooting. And, mm -hmm. um, but I have to say that I do enjoy very much uh, documentary as well. I think it's a powerful medium. And especially if you're passionate about a theme, it's a, it's a great way to to get your own opinion out and to inform people of something that you feel passionate about. So I'm kind of, you know, going a little bit in between both, but I would say that my, my biggest passion, what I really want to do is, is fiction film. And my, 
some of my older fiction uh, work. I don't have it published on my website because uh, you know it's been so many years that uh, yeah. I keep it in my drawer at home. <laughs> One day, one day, one day we'll do the, um, you know, the throwback Thursdays. Yeah. Um, as I said, when I was presenting you, you are actively involved in the equality and creating more opportunities for women and people with diverse backgrounds, not only in Denmark, Spain, and the United States. Okay, this is going to, well, now we're going to statistics in Spain because you live in Barcelona. Mm -hmm. And um, I, I, I would love that we could dedicate about three hours to this, but it's yeah, me too. possible. <laughs> and I still have loads of other questions for you. So let's stick it really short. According to a study made by the Spanish Association FEMA in between 2015 and 2016, in Spain, only a 26% of positions of responsibility in this industry, in feature films, not documentaries or animations, are held by women versus a 74% by men. And instead of increasing to be paired, Another study by the same association in 2017 says we have lost a 2%. Um, I'm gonna run this really quickly. Direct, mm. okay, so we are only 16% um, in direction, screenwriting 17%, uh, production 26, photography 2%, film editing 8%, music 8%, production direction 44%, artistic direction, 44%, sound, 7%, um, special effects, 3%, wardrobe, um, 83%, and makeup and hair, 75 Hey, you yeah. can get your ass. We are Girly things. Makeup and, and, and hair. <laughs> yeah. Now, what do you think needs to be done, or what can we do? to pair this? Yeah, I think uh, that is exactly the question. What can be done? Because we do have to do something. I mean, it, this is not something that's just going to change by itself. Um, I realize that it's something that, you know, we all would like to change this overnight. That's not going to happen. Um, this, These are years and years and years of... of uh, well, it's, it's like a whole history of women not really having uh, the same equal white rights as men um, and also not being included in um, uh, for work, uh, not being able to vote, having to ask their, hus uh, their husband, yeah, their husband for permission to get a, a driver's license, um, you know, all these things. It's so recent. It's just maybe 50 years ago that my or 60 years ago that my grandmother had to ask for permission from her husband to, to do a, a language course because she wanted to learn French. You know, what, what is this? Mm -hmm. So the so one thing is that we have to accept that it's not just something that will happen overnight. Um, but another thing is that we, we are able to do things. And one of the things that I believe firmly in are quotes. I know a lot of people don't like that, uh, but I think it's very important. Um, quotes meaning you need to, when you, for instance, have a film festival, uh, you need to say 50% has to be women. Um, the same goes for different types of programs or fundings or things like that. In the beginning, you need to set up those rules and you have to say 50% needs to be women um and i don't care about men saying that yeah but uh you know that's not okay because we're not looking at gender we're looking at the the talent it's not true that we don't have the same opportunities and possibilities and until we have those then you need to put in these percentages to make sure that women are included another thing is that we th there's a big big problem <coughs> And having men telling women stories, you know, having this in the same way that it's a big problem having white people telling a black person's story. I'm not saying that it always has to be a black person telling a black story, um, but we have to be really sensible about this and aware about this. And we have to, when we look back, 
when I look back at, you know, the movies that I was watching as I grew up, what role models did I have? None. I didn't have any female directors to look up to. I didn't have any strong female leading actresses. Um, you know, I can mention just a few. Sarah Connor in Terminator. Um, you know, Sione Reaver in Alien. And that's about it. Uh, so, so I don't have the same type of role models as men have had. Uh, growing up, watching films, seeing strong heroes, you know, men who take action, men who can do things, men who can go out in the world and save the world. I didn't see that when I grew up. So that's going to affect me, of course. That's going to affect us all. Um, and I really believe that that is uh, something very important that we have to change. We need to see a lot more stories about women and not just about women. We have to see strong women in strong uh, leading roles that go out and take action in the world because that is going to change things. And then, of course, uh, talking about the quotes, this is not something that we should have for the next uh, 10, 20, 30 years. This is something that slowly we can get out of these quotes and out of these percentages because things will have normalized, in my opinion. But I think in the beginning, you must do these things. You must look at, at percentages and quotes and make sure that women um, and, and women of all type of diversity is included. You know, we're not just talking about white women here. We're talking about women of different color, of different age. This is another um, important issue, especially for actresses, who it seems like when they reach 45, they're no longer um, interesting for the big screen, while it seems like men just grow, you know, as older they grow, the more interesting they are, and the younger their, their you know, female, um, um, how do you say, like female lead or the, the, the one next to them are. And that's wrong you know that has to change as well so uh, <laughs> okay there are two things i wanted to talk um just really quickly going back to what you said um for me we 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 have to this is how i see it we have to start by um calling things by their correct names stories are to be told it doesn't matter what race you are, what nationality you are, what religion you process, you believe in, mm -hmm. or what sex you are. It's a story and it has to be told. So you don't need to be black to tell a, a, a story of a black family. You don't have to be a woman to tell a story of a woman. You are a creator and creation is sexless, it's colorless and it's religionless. So I don't know if this makes sense to anyone, but this is how it's supposed to be. That's starting one. Now my question for you um, as a filmmaker, why do you think that um, not many, but I would say close to many um, projects are requested to um, male directors, male techs behind the scenes? Okay, because I mean, I am, I am sure there are many um, female sounds and female dogs and female um, special effects. But why do you think or might think that when um, someone has a project that they want to move, why do you think they, they request men to do this and not women? You mean like when we go and ask for fundings or try to get our projects made? In that sense? Yeah, being your project or let's say, um, well, okay, hey guys, I'm a screenwriter and I have a film and I would like this, okay, well, I'm going to be looking for maybe more of a guy team than of a mixed team. Hmm. Well, I think it's, I think a lot of it has to do with habit, really. Um, I mean, we can also talk about the whole men's club, which uh, can sometimes be a little bit intimidating for women when they walk into a set and uh, you walk into maybe uh, 30 guys who are standing together talking about the last night's football game and the other day they went to a strip club for the birthday of their buddy or, you know, it can be very hard for women to come in to that t type of conversation. 
um, therefore also very hard sometimes for women to be networking um, in this type of environment. And, and I think it has a lot to do with habit. They are used to working together. We're used to mm-hmm. especially see men on these positions um, that are very technical. So like um, director of photography, sound, visual effects, things like that. Uh, we're so used to seeing men. Um, also in general, we're used to seeing men in leading uh, positions with a lot of responsibility. Um, this, for instance, I also think is a reason why I read a study uh, made by the Danish Film Institute in Denmark that proves um, that not only do men get more projects approved, they also get and get this double the budget of the women. Why? Because there's a tendency to not trust women with that much money. You know, how many women do you see make a huge, big budget Hollywood <laughs> film? Very well, few. I'm going to tell you one thing. I read, and I can't remember where I read it, um, and, 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 but I did read that um, comparing uh, the expenses in a, a masculine production and a feminine production, and women spend much less money doing yeah. the same exact film. Yeah. So They're I just all- think that. Yeah. There are also budget. I mean, there are also um, research done regarding how much money they actually make afterwards. The films, um, and it proves that uh, actually the the films that are directed by women make far more money. Probably because they get less budget and they know how to work the budget so that they actually make a good movie, but for less money, which means you have more room for um, benefits. Um, so, but I think it's interesting um, to look at this. And I think that is also why we see often a little bit more normalized. If we look at documentary, we see more um, female uh, directors as, you know, doing documentary than fiction. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because documentaries tend to have lower budgets. So yeah. it's again, something about trusting women with a big bag of money which is something that uh, a lot of people are not so eager to do. And again, I think it's, it's about the mentality that has to change. Um, and you have to give women the opportunity to show. And this is, again, why I'm talking about quotes and, you know, um, making it mandatory for festivals and um, places where you, uh, uh, where you ask for money to go in and give that to yeah, half to percent be, to be a 50 50 yeah because you have to give the women the opportunity to prove themselves and to prove that they can do it um yeah that that's what i think okay well i guess we all have to just you know chip in and do our own part of responsibility to make this happen because um another thing that i read which i found it so so um surprising um the use of words such as in this industry, such as feminized and masculinized areas. Yeah. Uh, considering that, for instance, um, masculine um, areas are production, direction, screenwriting, music, dub, editing, sound, special effects, whereas feminized areas are um, wardrobe and makeup and hair. Yeah. And I am sure that uh, there are many um, men specialized in makeup and hair specialized in wardrobe who are saying no because i do it and i was i'm a professional in that area and why should i be excluded exactly so yeah. I mean, it's, it has to be a win-win for for the both yeah. because at the end of the day it doesn't really matter whether you're a woman or a man it what matters is that it's a story that needs to be told exactly so it's yeah. a director it's not a female director or male director it's a director point that's it yeah and that's what really at the end of the day it, it, it really um the importance is that word is that we use the, the, the correct um, terms yeah definitely and i think in general uh, we all benefit from this you know we all benefit from having more women um True in a production Uh, we know this from just like normal workplaces office spaces you know there is just much more um well not only equality but there is a certain balance also when you have 
half percent women and half percent men. And we all have, you know, our different um, qualities that we can, and when we work together, I mean, honestly, I also think many guys would prefer to have a production that has more women. It's not about the men not wanting us to be there. It's about, you know, uh, like a, a long history of women really being suppressed in many ways. And it's just recently that women are getting out, doing their career, getting jobs, um, doing things for themselves, seeing themselves as being um, powerful women. Um, it takes guts to walk into a set as well as a director. Um, it does. And a lot of women have not grown up with that sort of uh, confidence or have not been taught that it's okay for them to have that confidence. And often if women walk in with a, an attitude of confidence, they're very quickly to be called bitch, yeah. you know? So that's another thing that women have to deal with because you can have um, a horrible director that walks into a set and scream and shouts at everybody and people will just do what he says. And the, I can tell you, if a woman does that, she will be called a bitch. Um, well, I, I was called a bossy, so. Yeah, you know. but still. it's the same thing. I, I <laughs> and I don't agree. I don't agree with that uh, the, uh, attitude. You know, I wouldn't walk into a set as a director, start screaming and yelling of people. Uh, I think that's a whole nother topic, actually, to talk about new ways of leading. Um, because I think there's a misunderstanding and thinking that the director has to be a tyrant and, you know, he, he's the big guy so he can scream and shout at the actors and treat them bad. And we all know uh, histories about uh, Alfred Hitchcock and some other directors. And, and I really don't agree with that behavior. I don't think it's yeah. necessary. I think we're all humans. We're all here to do a job. You know, um, nobody is here to be a slave for anyone. And, and thanks to everyone on set, we're doing this film. You know, it's not just the director. So I think that is something that women can actually go in and kind of lead the way to show uh, a new form of, of leading and being um, in charge and powerful without having those negative um, attitudes. Mm -hmm. True. Mm. I agree. I agree. The, the, the thing is just that um, we have to learn that certain um, positions are sexless. They are just yeah. positions and, and that's it. Exactly. And like I said, it, it, there's a story to be told and it has to be told, be it by who it is. It doesn't really matter. Definitely. Um, what, I, I, what I wanted to say about that is that I completely agree with you and and I and I think as storytellers we should be able to to you know be able to tell any story. I think the problem is when uh, we have almost only men telling stories about women um without maybe even doing research or talking to women. So they have these very uh, you must know that also as an actress or feel it, you know, that you're always getting these stereotypical parts for women. There is a lot of hookers and lovers and strippers and, you know, that sort of um, where the, the more important, deep parts, they usually go to the male lead. And I tell you one thing I realized also only just a few years ago, I realized that every time I started a script, writing a script, my lead character was a man. And suddenly I said to myself, Louisa, what are you doing? Why are you writing about men? What, how do you know how it is to be a man and be inside his head? It doesn't mean that I can't write about men, and I still do. But it means I am so influenced by the movies I have seen growing up and still watching that I did not even have the capacity, capacity in my head to think of stories with women. Even a story that, you know, was genderless. It didn't matter if it was a man or a woman. I would still put in a man. I wouldn't put in a woman. Mm -hmm. And that I, I started changing. And I started putting women into my stories instead of men. But, you know, very um, aware of it and doing it on purpose. Mm -hmm. That's, that's, that's very good. I mean, um, I always say that change um, starts at home and then yeah. we take it out and we, just, we just, we just 
contaminate everyone else with change. But it yeah. has to start at home um, in every way. I mean, you can't pretend to say, no, uh, a director can be a woman or a man when, for instance, your husband is telling you that you have to cook and you have to clean and he's not going to do anything. And yeah. your children are seeing that and watching that. They won't understand why you are going against what he's saying. No, everything, this is teamwork. I always see this as yeah. teamwork. Be it at home, be it in an office, or be it in, on set. This is teamwork and we need to work together, be it women exactly. and men together because, I mean, we're here to do this together. It's not, uh, you know, uh, an individual thing. Yeah. So, and I, I mean, I hope this, this will one day work. <laughs> okay, though. So now let's go into other interesting questions. Yes. Um, what are your favorite genres as a filmmaker and as a spectator? <laughs> um... I think I know that I tend to write and do drama. So I'm always very much into very complex themes, taboos, you know, places where other people sometimes don't dare to go. I like to dig in there. Um, so I, yeah, so I know I'm very, very much into, into drama um, and kind of psychological things. Um, as a um, as an audience, I'm more of a. I like to. I still like dramas and I like thrillers, psychological thrillers. Mm -hmm. um, I'm a little bit obsessive with serial killers. I think <laughs> I really like that theme and and psychopaths and everything that has to do with the mind. Um, and I've never been like really crazy about science fiction, but I'm starting to really enjoy that genre because we have a lot of series and, and movies coming out lately that are kind of this near future dystopian mm -hmm. society films which I think yeah. are very interesting so mm -hmm. I'm definitely starting to enjoy more that uh, that genre um okay um it is it is known by everyone in this industry that it's it's a hard-working industry Persist persistence, having the right contacts, and loads of luck. What would you tell your past you? And what would you tell your future you? <laughs> uh, yeah, that, it, it's such a hard question. Um, I think I would tell myself that um, networking is very important. So believe people when they say it. <laughs> sorry yeah. I think I just okay I just had a call that's why sorry okay. <laughs> no um you tend to think that well yeah networking okay you know everybody says that but it is actually very important and I think one of the problems that I uh, suffered was that I studied film in Denmark mm -hmm. and I went to New York and I studied film in New York as well and then I came to to Barcelona and I did an online course because the one you mentioned before the post degree was an online course. So I didn't do any networking um, in Barcelona in the beginning. And that was a big mistake. Um, this is something that I'm very much into now. <laughs> um, and also I would tell myself to invest in your future. Like you do have to, you do have to spend some money and not be afraid to do it. Um, I never did like proper film school. I never did the four years. I did a little bit here and a little bit there and a year there and a year there. Um, just as I was saving up money. Uh, but I would probably tell someone today that if that's really your big wish to go to film school, do it. Go get that loan. Um, you don't have to go to the biggest, most famous film school in the States because that can ruin you. Um, but you can find maybe more reasonable priced film schools um, mm -hmm. where you will learn a lot. And for the future me, I will tell myself to keep going. <laughs> And uh, just like keep your passion and keep believing in yourself. And, and I think I'm 38 now. So if I'm still going at it, uh, it must be because I just can't let it go. 
so I will continue. <laughs> Great. Um, well, you'll have loads of success, and you know that. It's just <laughs> a matter of, it's just a question of, of believing in yourself and yeah. persistence and insistence, and sometimes things it come is. you least expect them. Yep. What with what? Which actors would you like to work with, and why? Oh. Yeah, I don't I don't actually have any like particular actors. Well, I will say that I have an actress here in in Spain. It's an actress called Belen Cuesta and she is getting, you know, more and more popular, doing more and more films. Um and I've seen her a couple of times and I absolutely love what she does on screen. I find her so natural, her way of acting um she's especially oh, I, thought, I thought i thought it was going to be me uh, also, no I hear Belinda, what? <laughs> nah, i'm, I'm sorry you're next <laughs> on my kidding. list <laughs> <laughs> no worries no worries <laughs> okay. no but i actually because i never really think about it in that way i mean obviously i can mention some big hollywood actors that i would love to to work with i i saw um hbo series um euphoria where I discovered this girl, Zendaya. I mean, I thought she did spectacularly well in that series. I thought she was amazing. Um, I love an actor like Michael Fassbender. I think he's really, really interesting. Um, and also because he has this natural way of, of acting. Um, so it's kind of easy to mention big actors that you love and you would, you know, you dream of working with them one day. Mm -hmm. um, but it really depends on each project, I would say, because I've also, you know, once I, I for my last short film, I cast a very young actress, a transgendered mm -hmm. actress, because that was the role. It was a transgender role. And, and I really wanted to give it to someone who was transgendered. And she was very young and with very little experience. But it was what I felt that you know, what I wanted to, I wanted to give this person that opportunity. So sometimes it's also very much about each project and who fits in and yeah, but, uh, but it's, 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 it's really much of what we always say. Um, each, um, each character has its own actor or actor. Mm. And, and that's, that's, that's how it's supposed to go because otherwise I don't think that the projects would have as much success as they do. If, um, if they were just chosen because of the name or who they are, no. et cetera, et cetera. I mean, it's just that the character has its own actor. And I do believe, yeah. um, I do believe in that. Which is something that, 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 that does happen a lot, you know, because people are trying to attach big stars to their project because then it will be easier to get fundings and easier to, you know, to get more hype around the project. Um, mm -hmm. And then the director kind of forgets to really think about the part and think that hey maybe even a someone unknown could do this part um i mean a great example is this uh the brazilian movie city of god which mm -hmm. used um street kids as actors and the movie was amazing and the acting was amazing um so so that's an example of it doesn't always have to be a big star although most directors, I guess, we dream of one day being able to to work with a star like that. But um, but yeah, it really depends on on each project, I would say. Well, I mean, obviously, I mean, this is something um, I, I've discussed other other in other interviews too. If you have a project, and let's say that the project has about ten actors, I I I've been in sales for many years, and I know that you have to have uh, the um, the boosting um, um, actor that that is going to be the one who's going to be selling your project because yeah. he's a, he or she is a very well known actor. But out of the 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 hundred percent of the ten actors, you don't need the ten actors to be very well known actors. You can have about yeah. half. Just give them yeah. fifty fifty and, yeah. and allow allow your project to be. Uh, sort of like a, a booster to um, non-known actors who have been actors for many years, yep. just dedicating either to theater or short films. And yep. that's, I just think that uh, the cake is big enough yeah. for uh, all of us to have a small piece of cake. Definitely. So, yep. 
that's something else that we should start thinking about too. Yeah. Um, Okie doke. What do you like doing when you're not directing? You're not creating. Yeah. Okay, I'm not creating. What's a normal day for Louise? Well, I'll tell you because I'm also um, very passionate about martial arts. So okay. I've done that since I was 11. And uh, this is also how I met my husband. So we ended up having a dojo together. Uh, together with two of our friends. So for, for those of you who don't know what a dojo is, it's basically a place where you train uh, Japanese martial arts. So mm -hmm. we started a dojo now some years ago and we do jiu-jitsu and um, Kyogoshin karate. In Barcelona? S yes, yes. Okay. It's called, for anyone who wants to go and have a look, it's called Kaifen uh, Barcelona. And... Um, and yeah, and it's something that I'm really very, very passionate about. Um, mm -hmm. I spend at least three times a week there on my training in the evenings and um, have great friends. It's a, you know, it's a great way to, first of all, of course, uh, stay healthy, get, yeah, you see, they're just, yeah, uh, <laughs> I spend the yeah. <laughs> there they are. Um, so it, it's a great way to stay in shape. It's very, very good for your, for your mind as well. So for people who, you know, are looking into meditating or doing something similar, um, this is also a, a great form of, I wouldn't say it's meditating, but it's, it's very good for your, for your mind. Um, and yeah, and they're saying that I'm not, and I'm missing my class today. It's true. <laughs> I should be there now. <laughs> yeah. But it, it, I, I will recommend anyone, and, and I want to say that it's the uh, one place where I found 100% equality. I feel completely equal to all the men there. Um, it's just me and another girl. The rest of them are men, and I never felt better. You know, I never felt more accepted than in the dojo. Have you got any upcoming projects you can talk about? Yes, I do. <laughs> I do have a couple of projects that are coming up. Um, I think the one that I would like to talk about, actually, and that, that I would like to tell you about is very related to like the whole COVID crisis and, oh, my God, we're in quarantine. What should we do? We can't make films. We can't, you know, get together. We can't have crews. Mm -hmm. um, and so I got involved during the quarantine with a Facebook group. It was very random. Um, it's managed or administrated by a, um, um, a woman from Hollywood. She is a, a documentary editor and her name is Tina Mahara and she runs this group and she's also very passionate about mentorship. So mm -hmm. So I got into this group and, and really I've, I've never experienced anything like it on Facebook. It was just such a wonderful energy in there, like very positive, um, helping each other, supporting each other. Tina's doing a fantastic job of really getting people together, um, bringing loads of her contacts from Hollywood into the group, talking to us, kind of leading the way. Um, and so... At one point, I realized, oh, my God, we're like people from all over the world in this group. And people are dedicated and serious mm -hmm. and they want to do things together and they want to help each other. And so I kind of pitched the idea to them that why don't we do a film, but in remote, like we'll do it completely um, remotely and we'll do all meetings, all rehearsals, castings, everything we'll do um, online. So like in a Zoom call or Skype. Mm -hmm. Um, and then we'll figure out how to do the shooting. Like if I have to sit in Barcelona and I'll direct the film through, through streaming and we film it in Los, An Los Angeles, then we'll do that. You know, it was like, we'll just do whatever it takes. Mm -hmm. And, and it was kind of my moment of thinking out of the box and saying, I refuse to <laughs> just sit here at home and being told that I can't do movies anymore. And we don't know when we're going to get back in production and all this. And I said, no, 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 no. And so we actually started now on this film and we're in pre-production on the film. Um, and so, yeah, so it's a big collaboration with a lot of people from all around the world. It is probably our biggest struggle is to find a time during the day when all time zones <laughs> come together. Yeah, and, that's a problem. Yeah, and none of us are sleeping or, you know. 
So, but, but we managed it and um, we are planning to uh, shoot in October. Uh -huh. um, sometimes maybe mid end September, uh, mid end October. Uh -huh. And we ultimately decided on filming here in Barcelona uh, for various reasons. It, it seemed to be a little bit easier, uh, but we'll probably do most of the post-production in, in Los Angeles. And uh -huh. we have the producers kind of spread out all over the world. We have a music composer, Oh my God, he's gonna kill me. I think he's from, I think he's based in Austria. I forgot, but you know, we're all over the place and it's great fun and they're amazing people. Um, and I couldn't be happier really about this project because it was just like a very random idea. I just pitched it to them and they grabbed it and then they said, let's do it. And that's, that's what I love when people come together like that. So you really did take it seriously about networking. Oh yes, oh yes. <laughs> this is this is a very serious group when it comes to to networking. Really, it is. Um, but on an international level, yeah. um, obviously we have we do have uh, some people from Barcelona and from Spain. Um, but uh, it's obviously networking on a more international level. But I think we can all benefit from that, the way the situation is now. I mean, I know I at least I have started looking a little bit outwards you know looking to also towards Denmark I have a project in Denmark that I'm developing and and now also more internationally because let's be honest we don't really know what's going to happen not with the pandemic situation not with the economical situation in Spain so I think it's wise and now we have a proof that we can do this you know, that we can, uh, we're able to talk through Zooms, you and I having an interview like this, you know, people mm -hmm. have realized, the world have realized that we don't have to sit next to each other to do things. We can actually do things remotely. Uh, we can reach out and do a lot more international projects, which I think is exciting. It is, it is. Um, well, I'm really excited about it because I joined the group not you know, about two or three days ago. Yeah, you did. <laughs> I'm so excited about um, um, giving back. Yeah. I am. I'm very, um, I'm a very give back giver, um, uh, generally speaking. I, I like to give back. I like to help. Um, I find that um, sometimes um, what didn't work for you can work for someone else. Exactly. And I think that is so, so important because you see your success in them. Yeah. And it's, it's just like being a teacher um, when you're teaching little kids how to read and write or when you teach your, your kid or, or a kid to, 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 to walk. It's, you know, they walk because you taught them. Yeah. And um, like I said previously, not everything is made for everyone. But that doesn't mean that you have to keep the information for yourself. You exactly. have to let it go and let it fly free because it's not yours. Yeah. It, it's, it, it was only um, given for you to use, but you have to set it free. And I'm very happy to be part of that group and mm -hmm. um, and be able to share my experience and, and whatever I can help and, and give out. It's just, you know, it's it's really good giving back. I, I just um, yeah. I just love that. Um, well, we are coming to an end. I'm so sorry. I would love <laughs> to just, you know, talking another hour. It's going to be very yeah. difficult. So I would just like to say um, thank you, Luis, for... Um, sharing your afternoon and your experiences with us and allowing us to know you a little bit better. I would like to um, thank everyone for following this interview and being there, not only today, but always there and supporting us, supporting us all, because um, this industry, this artistic industry would not exist if it didn't have followers and fans and people yeah who invest their money going to films, theaters, etc. So we are very grateful that you all exist and you all are there for us. Um, and we only um, try to be better for all you guys. I mean, that's how it works. I would like to um, tell you guys that um, you can follow Louisa's career on her, uh, on her social media, which I will be including um, on the video. And um, our guest for next Tuesday is an American filmmaker Stephanie Cookie Carson. So don't miss it. It's going to be as interesting as today's um, interview, <laughs> but with an American version. 
And um, yeah. I just want to ask you all to be very responsible and stay safe and don't forget your masks, please. And well, loads of kisses to all of Thank you. Thank you, Jasmine. A huge kiss for you, Louise. <laughs> I hope to see you for very you. soon. Well, next time I go to Barcelona, I'll definitely call you. Please, and have please a do. You. Yes. And Definitely. well, I'll see you all very soon. Bye.